dem da und da und da und da Welcome to Chapter 11, Advertising and Commercial Culture. We're going to start talking about the advertising industry. Some of you are really in this class are really interested in this aspect of mass comm. Um, there's a whole lot to talk about, but let's get started. Dealing with uh, advertising, a couple things you should uh, know about advertising. Last few years, a lot of the advertising, which you're very aware of, has been more based in on the web, on internet. Heck, just trying to find a way to know everything about us, which is kind of scary and spooky. We talked about it earlier in class. The internet has definitely changed the way advertising app operates um, and how they advertise and they've t and and how they get their information. Um, but there are some still some constants, uh, still some technology still doing pretty well. You know, the uh, of what's considered the legacy media television is still doing uh, uh, pretty well it is still a popular format of media consumption even though it is changing with the advent of like Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu and this on-demand stuff um, and it's probably gonna change in a different way as well they're probably gonna find a different way to advertise in this new medium of what television may eventually become I do not think it will be the same thing it is today, five, ten years from now. And advertisers will definitely find a way to best put out commercials for their clients. Television has still maintained a good percent of the uh, the share of, of revenue. Uh, it's still a very popular medium. You can see 38% in 2015, and that's, that's a rise between 2007 and 2015. So... Uh, they're still doing a, a pretty good job with uh, advertising. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. Time to make the donuts. Hey, where's the thief? I don't think there's anybody back there. Okay, so now we're going on our journey in the history of advertising. Uh, believe it or not, even before we get to what we see on the slide here, talking about the earliest ad agencies, there's been advertising going on in some way, shape, or form. Uh, since exactly 3000 BC, and we talked about Babylon. People in ancient Babylon would ha hang signs outdoor, uh, usually carved in stone and wood, so people could spot their store uh, stores. Um, if you think about that, it is a type of. We still have store signs to this day, and it's a kind of advertising. Advertising goes so far back that even archaeologists found advertisements on the walls of the ruins of Pompeii, the, the ancient Italian city that was destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. So advertising has been going on for a very long time. It's, it's been in print form. At one point in history, they would even use town criers as a form of advertising for certain companies. Now, early on in, our, in this country's history, we didn't really need advertising agencies. We were more of an agricultural society, and the cities were not nearly as big. Only until the Industrial Revolution did we start seeing a need for advertising on a bigger scale. This is where we start seeing the beginning of the evolution of what we see today as the advertising business. The first advertising agencies were called newspaper space brokers. Basically, what they would do is they buy space in the newspaper and they sold it off to the merchants to advertise their businesses. Newspapers were all for these brokers because they were used to about 25% of their people that they would make agreements to to not follow through on payment. So they these brokers would pay up front. So they were they were guaranteed money by using these brokers. So it was a better deal for the newspapers. Now you'd ask, but what was the first ad agency? Well, what is considered the prototype of the first ad agency in 1841 was uh, Volney Pond. Um, it was in Boston, and 
basically for 25% from the newspaper, he would sell space to those advertisers. So this was the first time you see your first quote-unquote ad agency. As the 1800s continue on, advertising is evolving. We are having more than just brokers. The first time we have our first full-service modern ad agency, N.W. Ayer and & Son, and they're based out of Philadelphia. They dealt with advertisers, they dealt with companies for products. So this establishes the first real modern ad agency of what we're used to dealing with today. Established in 1869, and believe it or not, it remained active until 2002. And you might know some of the slogans and some of the commercials over the years. You may, you may not, such as uh, Morton Salt. Morton Salt, when it rains, it pours. I'd walk a mile for a camel for camel cigarettes in 1921. A diamond is forever, De Beers. That got established in 1948. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Reach out, call up and just say hi. Reach out and touch someone. This was very big. I remember this from my childhood. 1979, it was it was long distance telephone service for AT&T. And be all you can be for the United States Army, 1981. Just a heads up, if you want to see those advertisements, just go to our content folder, check out the, the thing I make for all the chapters, and you will find all those different commercials. Another huge aspect of advertising that came out of this era uh, was trademarks and packaging. This is where we first start seeing name brands. Basically the same products who have about the same quality, but just because they marketed a certain way, have presented a certain way, and they have a good advertising campaign, people tended to think, oh, this one's better than, this brand is so much better than this brand. This is where we first start seeing that. We still do that to this day. Do you really need to have Tropicana orange juice over uh, Florida Natural? And it just, it proves that, you know, the brand name means something. And this is where we first start seeing that this is the advent of the brand name the trademarks other such first name brands smith brothers the cough drops quaker oats uh, they were the first cereal company they to, to register a trademark believe it or not well all they did was use the image of william penn the founder of uh, pennsylvania the quaker founder of pennsylvania that simple act of putting william penn on the quaker oats box told people that that company was honest it was decent and and has is a very hard-working company. Quaker is still in business today. Another very long-living brand you're all familiar with, Campbell's Soup, 1869. We still have Campbell's Soup. What most of you probably think when you think of soup, you think Campbell's Soup. Mm-mm, good. You know, soup is good food. These are the things I remember at growing up. Other brands are Ivory Soap, Levi Strauss, Kodak. All big names that you may know today. Another result of this time is the cost of those things that are the brand names. The thing that makes them more expensive is the advertising that they put into it. These companies have to charge that much because they have to put so much into the advertising end. These companies need to charge more. By the end of the 19th century, about one-sixth of all the print ads that were being produced came from what were called patent medicines and different drug companies. And these patent medicines, this is where you get the term uh, snake oil salesman. You may have seen movies with depictions of these kind of medicines, quote-unquote, but they really weren't medicines. They were fraudulent. They, 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 had, um, they had a lot of alcohol in it, that's for sure. Um, things called such as uh, Lydia Pinkham's Vegetable Compound or Dr. Lin's Chinese Blood Pills or uh, William Radom's Microbe Killer with a lot of these quote-unquote medicines and miracle liquids and, and potions. They actually contain things like morphine. They also had things like ethyl alcohol, which isn't usually good for us. Also, you'll find other things during this time such as Coca-Cola. It's Coca-Cola because there were trace amounts of actual cocaine in Coca-Cola at the time. Now it's it got replaced with caffeine, which we're all very used to. There are all other things such as uh, 
the cereals at the time, Kellogg's and Post, claimed they could help stomach and digestive problems. Now with all these fake claims of what these foods and, and medicines could do, this spurred on what was the Federal Food and Drug Act uh, in 1906. This is where we start seeing federal intervention uh, of monitoring products like this. Also during this time uh, there was the rise of the department store. The mom and pop stores started going down a little bit because they were creating these stores that had much more space. More and more people are moving into the city, so they have bigger stores. This is, they have a lot more stock on their shelves in the smaller businesses. So this is where we start seeing the rise of department store advertisements in newspapers. This is where it really takes off. Only recently have department stores started really going downhill with the fall of the shopping mall. And very much like today with the criticism of how online shopping has destroyed the shopping malls of the country and the shopping malls in the very recent past were said to be destroying the small businesses on Main Street. This is where we see the department stores were being criticized for destroying the small businesses because of their ability to offer so much more and be able to charge a little bit less. So this had a huge impact on the newspapers as well. This is where we see the ratio of actual news and editorial content in the, in the newspapers. They go down, and this is where we see increase in ad sales. But now, as you all well know, we've talked about many times with the fall of newspapers, there's not nearly as much advertising because not nearly as many people are buying those newspapers. Yeah, they may, they found other ways to advertise, but it's not anywhere where it was when this first started. It has dropped dramatically. The somewhat recent recession we had back in 2008 uh, hit, hit the newspaper industry hard too. So in addition to the, to the internet and then the recession, these things have really made huge contributions to the, the sad state of the newspaper industry from a financial standpoint today. As time goes by, it's the turn of the century. We're in the 20th century now, the 1900s. I know, it seems so long ago. This is where we start seeing uh, advertisement and advertisers leading to social change. And they, they start uh, putting out values. Previously, to this, it was just advertising goods and services up to this point. Now they're going in a different direction. This is where we see advertising changing the way the society is working. Before, it was a producer-driven society, and now it becomes a consumer-driven society. Uh, it starts promoting technical advances, starts encouraging economic growth. Advertising created a new demand for these products. The sudden switch in approach created a new market, and the previous startup costs of these new companies started to be, co be recovered more quickly. Advertising spread the word. They did their job and they did it well. With the technological advances of the time, advertising is right there. I mean, they are helping with advancement of, of automobiles, of the washing machine, of vacuum cleaners. This new advertising industry and the way the advertising industry evolved, this really helped those machines and others to get the notoriety they, they might have not gotten before. And of course, because advertising did such a good job, that meant... Show me the money. <laughs> these producers of these new goods and services were making money, making money, making money. And then in turn, they were making money, making money, making money. But one down part of that is the consumers didn't always get a cut in the cost of these things that they were buying. Among other things was a change in the advertising strategy. Much of the advertising of that time was targeted specifically to women. They realized that women were making most of the decisions of what certain products were being brought into their house. The advertisers decided the women are making the decisions we are going to market all these products specifically to appeal to women. Another strategy the advertising industry took during this time was the campaigns many of the times would threaten citizens, almost with like a social failure if they didn't buy that product, such as uh, Listerine. If you don't use Listerine, you'll have bad breath, which will lead to spinsterhood. Oh, that's just terrible. Imagine that today. I really don't think that would fly today. And also anti-dandruff shampoo. 
People with dandruff are guilty. As time went by, by the 1920s, a lot of the agencies started doing more positive campaigns with products. And they focused on the pleasure of these products, such as MetLife Insurance Company. You'll have a happy, robust life. Soap, you deserve an afternoon of leisure. Radios, here's a picture of keen enjoyment, which is kind of ironic because there's no picture because there's it's radio. <laughs> but you see what the advertising was doing there. We also see a big change with advertising for the government, World War II. During that time, they established the War Advertising Council. It was a group of agencies. They volunteered to do this, and they organized campaigns for war bonds, blood drives, and unfortunately, at the time, which was a reality, rationing of goods because they were at war. It was an extreme time. This is where we also see the formation of the Ad Council. You've seen many different ads over the years, public service announcements. This was not the norm before all this time. They started using their creative strategies to advertise important issues and organizations that were more than just about money. These were about making the world a better place through many different organizations around the country. Due to some of the questionable tactics that the advertising agency had taken in the past, the federal government took measures by creating several agencies to oversee the business world because there were many, many different complaints over the years. Agencies such as the Better Business Bureau, the Audit Bureau of Circulations, the Federal Trade Commission, the American Association of Advertising Agencies. This is where we start seeing a code of ethics start to form as well within the agency. Another tactic used by the advertising industry was that of subliminal advertising, hiding disguised messages within their advertisements to get people to buy or think a certain way. It was subtle, it was intentional, but studies found that it really wasn't that much more effective than your typical advertising. Up until the 1960s, the advertising industry would focus mostly on slogans. Slogans were the big strategy that these agencies would take. And that was until the 60s. The 60s were definitely a different time in this country, a changing of the guard. And this is where we start seeing a whole other approach. This is where we start seeing them bring in European designers in on their advertising campaigns to bring in a more artistic look to what they were doing. They started focusing more on making things look beautiful and nice and uh, having a better aesthetic, a visual uh, aesthetic to it. They wanted more in the design as well. So this is a big step for the advertising agency. So as we leave the 60s, we're going to the 70s, now we start seeing teams of writers and campaigns and things becoming more complex. It's more than just slogans. It's more than just pretty images. We start seeing more development to the plots, quote-unquote plots and campaigns, and they're becoming more complex. They're becoming layered uh, and because they start hiring writers and other artists. and uh, the, the advertising industry and the art form that they perform uh, is is taking a different turn. It's, in, it's becoming much more complex than, than before. Which then leads to the 1980s. Cable television, more specifically MTV. MTV explodes on the world. Music videos, which were brand new. And if you've ever seen some really old music videos when they first started, there are some definitely weird things being put on. Uh, they, on MTV at the time. Um, yes, they actually had music videos playing on the MTV channel. There wasn't 17 MTVs back then. Um, and there was no such thing as Teen Mom or anything like that. They had actual music videos, and the music videos they put on there were kind of bizarre because a lot of these video directors were video artists, and they were doing some very abstract things, like there'd be a horse walking in the scene for some reason, and then there's a red scarf blowing in the wind past the horse, and that's supposed to symbolize something. What that necessarily had anything to do with the song being sung, nobody really knew, but it was different, it was new, and they experimented, and the advertising agency saw the big explosion of, of a whole other look 
and a whole other feel, and they just latched onto it. Then you started seeing the change in advertising with things that seem like music videos that fit right into the whole MTV generation genre. And then we go into the 90s, where eventually, with the advent of the internet, that totally changed things because now that's where we start where we are today and they started advertising and banners and all sorts of different things like that and now we have now we can't look at anything online without someone knowing what we're looking at and heck look oh there's an advertisement three seconds later we go to another page there's an advertisement so it's evolved very much over the last few decades now we're going to talk about the different types of advertising agencies that are working out there right now. That is probably a pretty important piece of information that those of you who want to be in the advertising industry one day would like to know. Where am I going to possibly work? Well, there's basically two types of uh, advertising agencies. One type of agency is the mega agency. They supply a full range of services. These are your bigger ad firms. They got that way by merging together with a lot of different other agencies along the way. And they have offices all over the country. There's WPP, there's Omnicom, Publicis, uh, Interpublic. These are some of the big mega advertising agencies. These are the places that you would want to work at if you wanted to be at the, uh, the major leagues of advertising. One of the things I wanted to do in television was to work at a major network. I got to do that. I was lucky enough to get to do that. For those of you interested in advertising, these are the big dogs of the uh, agency. Then you have your smaller, what they call boutique agencies. They don't have a whole lot of clients. It's a smaller agency, smaller amount of people. The, the amount of clients aren't as many, but the ones they have they're very loyal to. These agencies are able to focus on these clients in a way that the bigger agencies might not be able to. These clients will not get lost in the shuffle as opposed to maybe possibly the, the bigger agencies. Some companies may like that smaller feel to it. They know they'll get the attention that they feel their company deserves. For those of you who want to be in advertising, this might be where you get your start. Uh, working right in the small agencies and then work your way up to a bigger agency or maybe you want to work in the boutique agencies your entire career maybe you want to create your own boutique agency whatever works best for you and your and what you want to do with your career now with the mega agencies they have a whole full range of services that can be advertising PR sometimes they have their own in-house radio and TV production studios those aren't cheap to show you how big some of these mega agencies are Omnicon, which is based in New York, had more than 74,000 employees in over 100 countries. They own global advertising firms BBDL Worldwide, DDB Worldwide, and TBWA Worldwide. They also happen to own three top public relations agencies, Fleischmann Hillman, Ketchum, and Porter Novelli. Publicis Group, which is in Paris, they have, they have agencies like Leo Burnett Worldwide, uh, and in Britain, Saatchi and Saatchi. Digitas LBI and the PR firm MSL Group, and they hire over 77,000 people around the planet. So these, these, these are very large agencies, and they have a lot of people to work with. The one big issue with these mega agencies is they have such a big piece of the pie, very much like when you talk, when I keep talking about television and radio and media. These agencies, these mega agencies, have so much control over advertising. These companies have received a lot of criticism for that. As for the boutique agencies, there aren't as nearly as many as there used to be, but there are some still out there where you can get your start with. One such is in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Peterson Miller Hooks, PMH. Their whole thing was a graphic national branding, and you may be familiar with one very notable advertising client, um, possibly Target. And now here's a graphic, uh, and we see how the major... Uh, global players in the advertising industry fair. There's WPP, number one, and this was in 2016. You have Omnicom at 15.32 billion, Publicis at 9.63 billion, and Interpublic it's about 7.5 billion for that year. And then it goes down a little bit more with the top 10 most profitable agencies in the planet. Uh, so this, this kind of gives you a little bit of a, a look to see who has what who's doing the most business, might give you some ideas in the future where you might want to work. Here's a graphic that focuses on, okay, 
This is, these are the advertising dollars and the money that's being spent. Where does it go? This graphic was created with projections. We look at uh, 2015 and you see how much television has and then digital and mobile. It seems to be just about a little less than uh, says 2015. You see the TV is the highest um, and then digital and mobile is just beneath that and then you have your print and you're seeing how that's dying um, and radio and out of home and directories um, obviously television seems to seems to have uh, television was seems that oh that was but that was in 2015 and these are the projections for the future years and we're seeing digital and mobile get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger even more with their projections. Uh, more money is being spent, but the distribution you're seeing digital uh, take more and more piece of uh, that pie. More money is being spent, and television is still doing just fine in under these. But you're seeing the real growth uh, in the web and the internet. Um, with the, the whole digital side of it, which I know you're not surprised at all, uh, being well, how you've grown up over the last few years.